so let me know what people are seeing. <laughs> I'm monitoring the chat. You are live. So we are, okay. yep, so I'm going to go ahead and do our count off. And then everyone, let's go. It feels tested. Let's go. We got Okay. All right, everyone, we're trying this again. Let me know how the quality is. Let me know if I'm cutting out a whole lot. It's quite possible. <laughs> um, but we'll try this one more time. So I don't know what you all caught of the introduction last time. Um, but this is Fields Tested, and I'm Kaslyn Fields. <laughs> um, and I'm going to... I put this in earlier because we were having so much trouble. Um, <laughs> and I went over the code of conduct and I went over some of the shows that you're going to see later. Um, so I just want to give another brief introduction to what I'm trying to do here, which is I'm trying to uh, give, give everyone a chance to see cloud native technologies in some form of context. So I'm going to try to do kind of small projects uh, with cloud native technologies. And the one today with this super broken slide <laughs> is going to involve uh, both Kubernetes and technically you can argue container runtimes. Um, and it is inspired by, I really need to fix these animations. <laughs> I'm gonna skip that. <laughs> it's inspired by, um, <laughs> thanks Pop. Sorry, I'm, I'm such a mess today. First stream. <laughs> so my goal for, for today is to try to host a personal blog on Kubernetes, uh, which we're off to a great start on. So <laughs> we'll see how this all goes. Um, but it's inspired by this tweet, which I posted on Twitter. Hopefully a bunch of you have seen it before, where uh, someone is trying to create a sandwich using, uh, <laughs> using power tools, um, which I would agree kind of feels like uh, what hosting a personal blog on Kubernetes seems like to me. But like I said in my promo, if you saw that, what good is an opinion without empirical evidence? Uh, so do I have other stuff in the slide deck? I don't think I do. Yeah, we're just going to tell a story now. So <laughs> um, thanks. I appreciate all the support so much. Everyone's been so nice. So uh, Part of the reason that I wanted to do a personal blog on Kubernetes for my first episode was because, like I said in the promo, if you saw that, I tried to do this like five years ago. <laughs> it's 
a very different experience. I'll tell you that much. Um, and I want to kind of, I, I could explain why I'm going to approach it the way that I'm going to approach it today, but I think it's better to tell a story. So let me tell you about why I tried to run a personal blog on Kubernetes like five years ago. Uh, so it's end of 2015, early 2016. I had just been laid off from my first job in the tech industry. Rough times, <laughs> but uh, it was okay. It, there were a variety of circumstances that led to it and it wasn't unexpected and I was in a, an okay place. Um, but I had, uh, I was now in the position where I needed to be looking for a job and I had gained some really cool skills around using containers in my last job. And now I had some free time. And something I'd always wanted to do was to have a blog, uh, especially one where I could post artwork, which if you've ever seen my website, caslin.rocks, um, I try to post fun artwork and, and technical stuff there. Uh, so I wanted to make that a reality and make it happen. And I'm a computer person. <laughs> like I work in the tech industry. Everybody's talking about how easy it is to build a personal website all the time, I feel like. I was like, Psh, I can do that, right? Further backstory, when I was in college, I actually skipped all of the web design courses through a variety of circumstances. So I've never done any web development at all. <laughs> I don't know the first thing about running a website. And <laughs> I'm uh, between jobs and I'm trying to run a personal website. I know a little bit about containers. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to run a personal website on containers. So I wanted to set that stage for you. And <laughs> from that starting point, we're going to explore uh, running a personal website on Kubernetes uh, today. So the first thing that I need to figure out as someone who knows a little bit about containers and absolutely nothing about web development is what does it take to run a personal blog? <laughs> So I've got a I've got a, a Google Doc up here that I thought we'd use to track our progress in trying to achieve this goal today. So our first question that we need to answer is what does it take to run a personal blog? Uh, Kaslin of five and a half years ago had no idea. So let's just Google <laughs> running a personal blog site. And I think the, the results today are going to be at least uh, similar enough to what I want, um, to what I saw five years ago. Uh, yeah, so we've got this uh, recommendation here from Google that says uh, the technical setup when starting a personal WordPress blog. So at this point in my life, I had heard of WordPress, I think, but I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I've heard of it before, and it's mentioning it here. So WordPress seems like a, a solid choice. Uh, there's also all these things like Wix and Squarespace and stuff that you always see all of the ads for on YouTube, at least I do. And um, so you could do something like that. Uh, let's look at one of those, maybe. Well, what I know about those is that they make it really, really easy to run a website. And at this point, I'm thinking, but I want to learn about using containers. I don't want to just take something that's given to me. I want to do it the hard way for learning purposes um, because I, I have good ideas like that. So, <laughs> so let's just look up WordPress. WordPress. So then I find this thing, WordPress.com. That seems like a good place to start. It says that 41% of the web is built on WordPress. Cool. That seems like a very reasonable thing for us to try to build a website with then. I don't know anything about it, but uh, it seems like a good place to start. And they have this start your website button, um, which I wonder what it'll do if I click on it. You'll have to like log in and stuff. Uh, but what I've learned since at least is that on WordPress.com, you can make your own uh, personal website. <laughs> uh, and please, folks in the chat, I would love to hear from you about your experiences with personal blogs. Are you all running 
personal blogs? Have you all tried to run it in Kubernetes before? Did you do something like this? Please tell me about your experiences because mine are pretty limited and we would all love to hear from you. Um, so what I've learned about WordPress.com is that uh, you can uh, spin up a website really easily here. It's like a lot of the other sites um, where it gives you really nice tools for spinning up a website really easily. Uh, you can figure out your domain name uh, and, and all of that um, just kind of within WordPress.com. Like I said, I'm doing this up the hard way. So instead, I go and buy a domain name, which I didn't know anything about before this. Um, domain registrars. Give you a sense of what I'm looking at. So I've heard of things like GoDaddy and, and domain name registrars before. Um, so I did a bit of research and looked around at a few different domain name registrars, and I bought a domain name, planning to make a personal website out of it. Um, so that was an important first step. And now we know that we want to try and use WordPress uh, for our personal blog. So like I said, I got a little bit of experience with containers. I want to see if I can run WordPress in a container. That seems like a good place to start. So WordPress Docker. I had been doing a lot of Docker work at this point. Um, so I was pretty familiar with Docker then. Less so now, I'd say. <laughs> but uh, if I go here, we've got a WordPress image on Docker Hub. So that seems like I'll probably be able to run a Docker container with WordPress in it. That's a pretty good start. Um, let's see how we can actually do that. So there's this how to use this image section, which you all probably can't see at all. Let me zoom way in and close this and make this a bit bigger. I'll make this even bigger. Maybe not that big. <laughs> so we're on Docker Hub and we've got this WordPress image and we're trying to learn how to use it. Um, now that I've done that, I'm going to open up a terminal. Woo. Hi, hopefully you all can see that well. <laughs> yeah, anyone running any personal blogs, please share. Love to hear from you all. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to run this thing in Docker. So if I run Docker on my machine, I can see that I've got Docker installed, which is good. <laughs> oh, you're running one, but it's not on Kubernetes. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what process you went through? I would love to hear, because I have an idea how other people approach this problem. <laughs> um, so we know that we've got Docker installed here. Uh, that's a good first step. I'm gonna maybe make this just a little, yeah, so that I can get back to this easily. I'll move this slightly over too. Haha. -ha. So I'm going to try to run this Docker command because that's what Caslin currently and Caslin of five years ago would try to do upon looking up something that I wanted to run in containers. I would just try to run the first thing that I. <laughs> so if I try to run this, uh, it won't find the WordPress image. So that's good. It's pulling the WordPress image. This is looking pretty good. <laughs> We're. Uh, so I found an, a container image to run WordPress, and now it's downloading that image. So in theory, I should be able to run this and actually run WordPress. Let's see. And it gives me an error uh, because it says network some network not found. So at the time when I was trying this, I was pretty familiar with Docker and probably had set up a few Docker networks. Oh, you use Jekyll? Cool. Thank you so much for sharing your experience allows you to launch a pre-configured blog website created using Ruby. Yeah, I, I hear a lot of good things about Jekyll. Uh, maybe I should try that someday. <laughs> uh, but so we we did Docker run uh, and gave it a name of some WordPress. And this network piece is the problem because uh, I don't have any Docker networks set up. At the time, I knew what Docker networks were. Current, present, Caslin does not. So I don't think I want to run it that way. Um, let's see what else we have in the information. Um, so the following environment variables are also honored for configuring your WordPress instance. 
We've got some stuff about WordPress DB host. So it looks like we're going to need a database to do this, which is interesting. A lot of people, I've, I've gotten the question pretty often of, can you even run databases in Kubernetes? So this is going to give us a chance to check that out, um, it seems like, which it is. <laughs> Spoilers, it is. <laughs> so... I know I'm going to need a database of some sort. I've got a bunch of environment variables here that I know nothing about because I know nothing about WordPress uh, that I'm going to have to figure out how to run. I've also got another Docker run command. Let's actually do a little bit more thinking about this one this time <laughs> since the last one failed. Um, if you'd like to be able to access the instance from the host without the container's IP, standard port mappings can be used. So this one is saying, I'm going to run a WordPress container and I'm going to run it on a specific port on the machine that I'm running it on. So that sounds pretty good. That sounds like something that we can do. Uh, so let's try that. Uh, I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to do Docker run. Some WordPress is fine and uh, do that. Oh no, <laughs> I must have tried this earlier. Docker PS. Um, Docker ps dash a. Oh, because I just ran that other command and it failed. Um, it actually created a container, but it didn't work out. So if I run Docker ps, I don't see any running containers. But if I run Docker ps dash a, which shows me all running and stopped and not in a good state containers, I can see that I've actually got the WordPress container that I tried to spin up. Uh, still, and it's using the same name. So it's not letting me create the container. So I'm going to run docker rm. And uh, fun tip, if, if you're working with Docker, you can just use any unique string from the container ID to refer to the container. So if I run this, I should be able to get rid of that container. Cool. So now my WordPress container that I created in error is gone. <laughs> and now... I should be able to run this new WordPress container that's using uh, port 8080. And at some point today, I'm going to mess this up. It's very important when running Docker commands <laughs> to use dash D, at least in my experience, because um, dash D runs the container in detached mode. And if you don't do that, the running container will take over your, uh, <laughs> it will take over your command prompt. So uh, I've, caused myself some problems before by doing that. Docker PS dash A, we can see that it's running. If I run Docker PS, I should also just see it. Yep, so this container looks like it's running happily. So it's running on my local host on port 8080. Uh, 8080 is the local host port and 80 is the port in the container that is being mapped to, I believe. I always get that mixed up, <laughs> but we do localhost 8080. Oh, look, we've got WordPress running. Boom, there you go. We're running WordPress in a container. Halfway there, right? So, oh, but it says that we need a database. So we really do need that database thing that we saw in uh, the Docker Hub stuff. Um, so let's see here. So our first question to answer was, what does it take to run a personal blog? I want to come back to this for a second and say we needed a domain name. We talked about that. And we needed to decide what to use to run the blog, which we're going to use WordPress. Um, and so now, can I run WordPress in a container was my next question. And we have determined yes, but I need a database. <laughs> so now I need to figure out how to run a, the database container that this WordPress instance needs. And a nice thing in this Docker Hub entry is that it has this YAML file that defines uh, what you could use for Docker Compose to tell Docker, spin up multiple containers for me. 
So that sounds pretty good. Uh, let's just try this, but let's see what we have in it first. So there's two services. The first one is called WordPress. That's what we want to run. That makes sense. Um, it's got port 8080, so I'm going to want to delete that container that I already have running if I'm going to run this, because otherwise it's going to have a port conflict. It's a good thing to, to spec at it first. Your blog is called Damon Sets? Nice. It's a good blog name. <laughs> um, and then there's all these environment variables that must be WordPress stuff. It looks like it's telling WordPress how to connect to the database, information about the database. Uh, db host, db user, db password, and db name. Then it's got a volume. So when I tried this like five years ago, uh, the instruction page here was a little bit different. I don't think it had the instructions to create this volume. Um, but since at the point where I realized that I needed to create a database container, um, I knew about Docker volumes. So Docker volumes are Docker's uh, tool kind of for uh, using persistent storage with containers. So if you have a container that's going to run some application that needs a volume, uh, uh, needs to have persistent storage that could persist if, say, the container were to go down, you would still want to keep that data. Um, then you're going to want to have a volume. So that makes total sense for a database. We probably want our data to persist. Uh, so we're going to create a volume. And in Docker land, uh, you can specify the name of a volume and then where it's going to be loaded into the container. So in slash var slash lib slash MySQL, which I assume is an area where it's important for MySQL databases to have persistent storage, um, we'll set up a volume that will persist even if our container ever dies. So that's good. And then we're setting up one for WordPress as well. Um, I'm kind of tempted to show you all what happens if you don't do that on the WordPress side, because it's pretty interesting. Uh, but we're already pretty kind of behind schedule, and I want to get to running this on Kubernetes without uh, taking up too much time. So I think I'll just try running this uh, Compose. So I'm going to docker rm-f83. Uh, so that I get rid of that WordPress container I was running earlier. Uh, so docker ps. Now I don't have that running. If I check ps-a, you can also stop a Docker container, and then you'd see it in ps-a uh, because it hasn't been removed. It's just stopped, uh, but it still exists. Uh, so I removed that one. It's not here anymore. Let's try creating a file. I'm going to call it uh, WordPress Docker.yaml. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> and I'm going to input uh, all of the stuff that I saw on the, the Docker Hub page. So Again, this gives me all of the information I need to create another WordPress container with environment variables that are apparently important for WordPress, and uh, to create a database container with also some important uh, things set up in it, and then volumes for each of those so that uh, storage will persist across restarts and things like that. So then if I run Docker, it actually has this on the Docker Hub page as well. Yeah, so we're going to want to run docker compose f, uh, give it the name of the file, and then up. And this actually has been changed so that you can do it uh, with a space instead of as its own command. <laughs> so docker compose uh, f wordpress docker.yaml, and then we're going to up that. OK, so now we see that Docker is building our containers that we defined in the YAML. Have you all done this kind of stuff before? How long has it been since you all worked with Docker? I'm curious. <laughs> it's been a while since I worked with Docker. I did a little bit of exploration before this uh, to make sure that I would not spend the whole time just looking up Docker commands, because <laughs> it's been so long since I used it. 
Oh no, you know what I didn't do? I didn't use dash D. So look what's happened. It's taken over my terminal. I hate it when I do that. <laughs> this is bringing back great memories. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, uh, what, am, what is going to happen if I control C this? Because I kind of want my terminal back. Um, maybe we should go to 8080 first and see if it's up and see if this worked. And then I'll worry about getting my terminal back. <laughs> Uh, so this is from before. Let's try localhost 8080 again. Let's reload this. Okay, so we've got WordPress page again. That's good. Oh, and this is different, you see? So last time it said that I needed to connect to a database, but this time it seems to be saying that I, I, I imagine that I have the database already. Uh, so my Compose should have worked. I've got a WordPress container running and I've got a MySQL database container running and they can talk to each other. Awesome. So now you can give your site a title and set up a username and set up an email uh, and all of that. Now, I was hoping to go ahead into WordPress and set something up and then kill some containers for you and show you what happens. Um, but what do you all think? We're getting kind of short on time. I think I might move on to running it in Kubernetes. That sounds good. I remember the first time I ran Docker Compose up. It was magic. I agree with that, Lucky. <laughs> How long has it been since you worked with Docker? I think Pop is asking everyone in the chat for me, but for me, it's been like five years. <laughs> yeah, run it in Kubernetes. Okay, so that's what we'll do next instead of uh, messing around with killing containers and seeing what happens with the persistent volumes and things. We can always explore that another time. So I'm just going to control C this. We don't need these containers running anymore anyway. It says that they're stopped. So if I run Docker PS, I won't see anything. If I run Docker PS dash A, then I see that they're still here, but they're exited, which is fine. I'm just going to leave them like that. Now, what I want to do next is figure out how to run this in Kubernetes. Luckily, a few years ago, I noticed that in the Kubernetes documentation, there is actually a really nice guide for how to run WordPress in Kubernetes. Cool. So here we've got an example in the Kubernetes documentation for deploying WordPress and MySQL with persistent volumes. <laughs> this is exactly what we need. <laughs> we just saw the how to do this with Docker. So now we're going to try to do it with uh, Kubernetes. And Lucky says, I use kind a lot. It's running in Docker under the hood. So you could say, I use it regularly. That is a fair point. <laughs> I've heard great things about Kind. I hear it's, it's really good. Uh, I'm currently using Docker Desktop, by the way, for all of the Docker stuff I was just doing. Really nice tutorials for that, too, if you want to practice your Docker commands like I did. <laughs> So this should be pretty much the same thing that we saw in Docker, but now it's in Kubernetes. So create persistent volume claims and persistent volumes. This is going to be the Kubernetes equivalent of Docker volumes that we just talked about a little bit ago. So interesting. It wants us to create a secret. By the way, I didn't practice this part of actually running it on Kubernetes. So if you have to go, no worries, but I'm going to try to do this uh, relatively quickly and kind of point out some of the important things about Kubernetes as we go. So they're wanting to spin up a secret, which is a Kubernetes object that stores a piece of sensitive data, which you all can't see at all, probably, <laughs> uh, like a password or a key. Since 1.14, kubectl supports the management of Kubernetes objects using a customization file. So you can create a secret uh, by generators in customization.yaml. Add a secret generator in customization.yaml from the following command. Uh, you will need to replace your password with the password you want to use. OK, so this is, uh, we're going to try to use a Kubernetes secret, which is first secret data. Uh, to set up a password for our MySQL instance that we're going to run in Kubernetes. That's a good thing to know. And let's look at some of the other stuff we're going to try and do here, too, before we move on. Uh, add resource configs for MySQL and WordPress. 
The following manifest describes a single instance MySQL deployment. Okay, the MySQL container mounts the persistent volume at slash var slash lib slash MySQL. So the same place we were mounting it in Docker, and we saw that that well, we didn't try deleting the the container and stuff, but I tried it earlier, and I will tell you that's the right location. <laughs> it would persist across restarts if we tried that. Uh, the MySQL root password environment variable sets the database password from the secret. Okay, so we need our secret in order to set our database password, which will be set up in this. So this file is a bit longer <laughs> than the one that we saw in Docker. Someone said, I get hung up with the network stuff and all this tech. Me too. Like I said earlier, the command uh, that made use of Docker network or for WordPress. I haven't used that in so long. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, not even using my nice mic. So I'm so sorry about my audio quality, <laughs> which hopefully just improved significantly. Um, kind plus B equals heart. Yeah, kind is great. There are great things about that. So this is a lot longer than what we saw in Docker, but let's see what we're trying to make here. So kind service. So the other one, in the Docker Compose example, which apparently I don't have up anymore, uh, we had two services, WordPress and MySQL. Um, and I, that was used a little bit differently than it's being used here. Here, it's a Kubernetes YAML manifest. So we're talking about the Kubernetes object of a service. So, Thankfully, I know this now because I've been working with Kubernetes for a while, but I'll tell you, Mia five years ago did not. Um, so we're going to name our service WordPress-MySQL, and we're going to give it a label app WordPress. And then, so we're specifying a port that our service is going to run on and a selector app WordPress and tier MySQL. So these selectors are how our service is going to understand uh, what actual containers it is serving. So a service in Kubernetes is one of the first things that you'll spin up if you ever do like a beginner's Kubernetes guide. I think most of the people watching have done that uh, before. <laughs> I just noticed that I still have a, a menu up. OK, so uh, it's one of the first things that you'll do in any beginner tu tutorial in Kubernetes is you'll spin up a deployment or some kind of pod, or you'll run containers in Kubernetes, basically. It's what we're going to talk about when we get to deployment. Um, and then you use the service to actually access that deployment. I still love and use Docker almost every day. Use the same approach that you've demoed, Docker Compose for quick POC and then followed by Kubernetes. Yeah, awesome. I love to see that that's a, a pattern that other people use. I find it really helpful to understand what I'm actually doing with the containers and, and how I'm actually running the application before I start bringing in Kubernetes objects. So the nice thing about a Kubernetes service is that it can be the, it can kind of act as a load balancer across a bunch of different uh, replicas of a container if uh, you want to run something high availability. Uh, so that's really nice. <laughs> I don't know that I need a whole bunch of copies of my WordPress for just running a personal WordPress blog. Um, but it's good to know that Kubernetes can do that. <laughs> uh, and then we say cluster IP none. Doesn't actually specify the type of uh, service explicitly. It's been a while since I've made a, a service manifest. So I find that interesting. I guess this is technically a node port one. I don't know. I need to look things up. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to move on to persistent volume claims. And then. The following manifest describes a single instance. I'm looking to see if there's a, OK. So this is just a slightly different one. Um, so this is a persistent volume claim. Uh, and it's being called MySQL PV claim WordPress. Uh, uh, it's getting the label app WordPress. Uh, and then it's going to be a read write once volume and 20 Gibby bytes. Cool. So this is uh, a local persistent volume claim, I assume. Do we need to 
Does it say something about setting up an actual persistent volume first? So MySQL and WordPress each require a persistent volume to store their data. We saw that in Docker. Their persistent volume claims will be created at the deployment step. Oh, okay. So maybe it's in our actual deployment. Yeah, there you go. Volume mounts and volumes. So that's where we're actually defining our persistent volumes. So in Kubernetes, it's not just volume, like it wasn't Docker. You've got a persistent volume, and then you've got to claim that persistent volume with a persistent volume claim, uh, which honestly I haven't worked with in a while. But I'm going to read a question. Here's my silly question. Let's say you didn't have a great guide like this. How do you know what keys you will need on the left-hand side? Do those match up with something? The keys I mean are like, oh, spec, metadata, spec, etc. I'm not sure how I would have gone about knowing how to use uh, or knowing that I need them. I have had that same question, I will tell you. Um, if you ever do the, the CKAD, Certified Kubernetes Application Developer exam, um, you will have to practice that a lot. You'll kind of get a sense for all of the important things that you'll need in every single YAML manifest for Kubernetes. API version is always going to be there. Kind is always going to be there because it's telling you um, what kind of Kubernetes object you're going to create. This first metadata one is pretty much there for every object because uh, you're going to need to name the object that you're creating and have the opportunity to give it labels. Uh, even Kubernetes node objects, for example, have labels. So that's a pretty common thing. And I think there's pretty much always the spec section. Uh, but what goes in it beyond that varies depending on what kind of Kubernetes object you're building. So you have to get a sense for uh, what Kubernetes objects are and what kinds of uh, YAML components <laughs> are, are applicable to those uh, Kubernetes objects which I would check out the documentation for, would be my recommendation. Yeah, uh, Daman, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, very sorry, <laughs> is saying, well, for the most part, there is a specific pattern to the spec. You specify the API version, object kind, uh, metadata, data, and the spec. Uh, but you can always use kubectl dry run to generate yeah, kubectl dry run is a really nice tip that you'll see if you ever practice for the certified Kubernetes administrator or certified Kubernetes application developer. Check out certs magic with Siam later. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a big tip for those is to learn how to use kubectl dry run to generate kind of uh, a base YAML file for doing this stuff. <laughs> cool. And then, yeah, okay making sure that there aren't any other questions. Good, good. So we've got a persistent volume claim here. We've got a service definition here. And we have a deployment definition here, which is pretty big. <laughs> Deployments can do a lot of stuff. Um, so deployment is how we're going to run our actual containers that we care about. Uh, interesting. So we have both the WordPress and the MySQL defined in the same deployment definition. Uh, WordPress dash MySQL is the name of this deployment. This makes sense. Um, so we're giving it a label app WordPress and selector match labels app WordPress tier MySQL. Not sure what that's selecting for. People know? Please let me know. I would love to explore that more. Um, strategy type recreate. So this is. Um, uh, something specific to deployments. Uh, it, I'm guessing it describes what will happen if something happens to the containers, something like that. I would have to actually look it up. Spin up a kind mini cube and go through the Kate stocks. They're super useful to get started and understand aspects of the YAML. Very useful cheat sheet. Very nice. Um, and then Got some more labels here, app WordPress tier, MySQL. Ah, so these selector labels are being used to uh, specify which pods in Kubernetes uh, the deployment kind of owns. We don't have a pod spec in here. We're not specifically saying we're making pods. 
Instead, we have this container section within the deployment. And the deployment just kind of knows, oh, you want to run containers? I'm going to put those into a Kubernetes pod object for you. Look at this. We're learning so many Kubernetes objects today. <laughs> Uh, and then we're specifying the container image that we want to use, which is MySQL 5.6. Uh, and giving it a name, environment variable. We saw this one before, MySQL root password. And then we're going to make that from a secret, like we talked about earlier. And uh, container port, name MySQL, uh, volume mounts, MySQL persistent storage, mount path var lib MySQL, uh, and all of that. I don't see a container definition with an, Im an image for the, the WordPress app. Did I miss it somewhere? Ah, single instance MySQL deployment. That would be why. Because <laughs> it's got this separate one just for the, My just for the WordPress. Um, so this is quite a bit more text than we saw in the Docker one. And we have, honestly, quite a bit more stuff for running things at high availability. Deployments have a lot of tools for running things at high availability. Um, I assume that's part of what this strategy one is about. I've got to go look that up again. Uh, and then a common thing that people talk about with deployments is doing rolling upgrades. Deployments have really cool smarts built into Kubernetes for that. Uh, so deployments are meant for being able to run things uh, in a highly available fashion, as are the persistent volume claim, as is the service. So we've got a lot of uh, really nice high availability tools in here. And then uh, in the other one, we've got a service, a persistent volume claim, and a deployment. So we've gone over kind of what all of that looks like. Great. So I want to try to just run this, if that's OK. And Pop, let me know if you need to go, because Pop is helping me run this stream since I was having so many technical difficulties. Everyone, big thanks to Pop. <laughs> I don't think that the YAML example has the persistent volume included. Uh, it's expected, uh, it's expecting to be created before it's executed. I thought that at first too. Something like this would work if you add it to the top of the example. Yeah, so you can specify a persistent volume separately. I've seen that done pretty commonly in specifying a storage class, as well as uh, the capacity of the storage. So Sporin, you don't think that this will work if we run it as is? Uh, yeah, because it's specifying volume, persistent volume claim. You're right that it doesn't seem to be specifying volume mount, name. Let's find a mount path. It's been a while since I've spun up a persistent volume, as you can tell. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and download these at least. Nice. We just need to add that bit. Does anyone know how to format the, the text in this chat? I think that's OK. I can format it myself. <laughs> The, the chat might not let you, but I can do it. Um, cool. Apply and verify. Get secrets. Verify that a persist. Oh, see, though? Verify that a persistent volume got dynamically provisioned. So this example is expecting that a persistent volume will be dynamically provisioned for us. I think I should try it and see if it happens. <laughs> so let's try this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and curl this. It's kind of nice that in the Kubernetes documentation, the examples uh, have these curl commands. Um, let, me, let me control C that for a second, not run this just yet. There we go. And control L. There you go. Much cleaner, much prettier, easier to see what we're doing. So I'm going to curl down the MySQL deployment.yaml that we looked through. And then I'm going to curl down the WordPress that we looked through. Thank you, everyone, for being engaged, by the way, <laughs> as we're going through this and I'm asking questions. I really appreciate it. OK, so now we've downloaded, created an episode one folder, and then I just put everything in the top level folder. 
I'll move all of this stuff later. So <laughs> uh, we've got our WordPress deployment.yaml, not the WordPress Docker, that's a separate thing, and then uh, MySQL deployment.yaml. So we have those files and add them to customization files. So here we're using cat to create another file, which will be called customization.yaml. And it just says resources and specifies those uh, two YAML files. But these instructions don't even include that secret that we saw at the beginning. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this one first. I feel like that should be in the bottom instructions. It. That seems reasonable. And then I'm going to run the other cat command that we have down here, which uh, sets up a customization.yaml that specifies the resources. Cool. So the customization.yaml file contains all sources for deploying a WordPress site and a MySQL database. You can apply the directory by running kubectl apply k and bash. Let's see if that works. 8080 was refused. This might be because I'm running on my work computer. <laughs> I would believe that. Oh, actually, do I even have... Uh, yeah, so I don't have a kubectl set up, I think. <laughs> Is my or a, like a local mini cube cluster setup or anything? That's kind of important. So let's do this. I'm going to open what we just talked about in Virtual Studio Code. This is an easy tool for me to use to get a mini cube set up. So there's a cloud code plugin, which is a thing that Google makes. So that's how I know about it because I work at Google, but it's just a thing <laughs> you can use. Um, and it can help you manage your cube config. I've got like this old uh, cluster in here that doesn't even exist anymore. So I don't care about that. Uh, but I do want to start a mini cube cluster. So I went to cloud code in Visual Studio Code. Um, and then I hit the plus button in the Kubernetes uh, thing. <laughs> and then I'm going to say start a mini cube cluster. Mini cube cluster is currently stopped. Let's start it. Oh, look, down here we can see that it's spinning up a mini cube cluster. You probably can't see it very well because it's super tiny. Um, but we are starting up a mini cube cluster, which we'll run this on. That should be good. <laughs> that might take a second. I haven't actually tried this, by the way. We're right, spinning up a cluster on this machine. So we will find out. And while it's doing that, like in the fast lane. Yep. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm going to minimize this. I don't think we'll need it anymore now that we're in cloud. Uh, stuff that we had earlier here. So this is kind of nice to be able to actually look at our YAML files. I don't know how long this will take, so um, we'll just wait around here for a couple more minutes. And if it's not done, maybe we'll do something else. I considered trying to set up a cluster in the cloud before I got started today, but thought, oh, Minikube will be fine. It'll be quick. <laughs> But once that's up, we'll run the kubectl apply command, basically, uh, which might be a little bit. Oh, would you look at that? It's starting to look a lot like Minikube. Oh, is that Docker? Oh, OK, that's Docker, because I opened that up. <laughs> Interesting. 
Uh, I haven't actually looked at the Docker plugin in Visual Studio Code, but you can see like all of the containers that I'm running. Hey, it's Minikube. I just saw a new one come up in Docker. Does that mean? Oh, creating Docker container. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So we can see in the Docker extension of, uh, of Visual Studio Code, the cloud code extension creating my Minikube cluster. That's pretty cool, but it's still not up yet. I got excited there for a second, but oh well. Uh, so once we do that apply, verify that the secret exists. So it's a good thing that we ran that cat command from earlier. Uh, we want to make sure that that secret exists. Looks like it's using customization.yaml. So I wonder what my customization.yaml file looks like right now, actually. It's getting toward 2.30. So if this keeps going with the mini cube, we'll probably stop here for the day and then try to finish up running our, our Kubernetes cluster next time when hopefully I'll have all of my technical woes figured out as well. Um, but the, our customization.yaml does have both the secret generator and the resources stuff that we added earlier. Um, so that's good. Hopefully when we run our customization, it'll run the secret generator and create our secret as well as uh, running our deployment.yamls. So that will run everything. Kind of like Docker Compose. Oh, it finished, yay. <laughs> so we'll see if I can do this quickly. Um, cool, so now I've got a mini cube cluster up and running and I wonder if I can zoom in on this at all. Oh, I can, yay, wonderful. I'm gonna close this. So I'm not running a, a GKE cluster right now. I'm just running a local one, which hopefully isn't sending my computer into a tailspin. So, <laughs> Uh, you can see all the deployments that we have running, all zero of them, all of our pods, all of our services. These are all of the Kubernetes objects that we might be running, which we are running none of currently uh, in our default namespace, which sounds like a fine place to run stuff to me. Cool. So let's see how we run this. <laughs> so I don't really remember. Um, Cloud code, run on Kubernetes. Hmm. <laughs> Looks like I've got some problems with my Visual Studio Code setup. So I might not be able to run this here, but let me see here. If I might go back to what I'm more familiar with, let me remove context under cluster. Do you wanna delete this old cluster that I don't actually even have anymore? from your cube config, yes, I sure do. So now my cube config should just have my mini cube in it. So if I do go back to my terminal, let me control L so that it's clean, cube CPL, just run that, see if it, ooh. Well, I've got the command, I already knew that, didn't I? <laughs> uh, get nodes. Look, yay, I'm in my mini cube cluster. So now I should be able to run this from the command line, which I'm more familiar with. So let's do that. It. Not KS, LS. I always like to check where I am. Okay, so now I should be able to run that kubectl apply command that we were looking at earlier, which is right here. So let's try that quickly and then we'll try to finish this up. Okay, it created a secret. It created, so the thing on the left of the slash here is going to be the Kubernetes object. Uh, and then on the right is the name of that object. So we've got a Kubernetes secret. We've got Kubernetes services. Uh, we've got deployments and persistent volume claims. But I don't see a persistent volume created. So maybe you're right. Maybe we do need to add that uh, to this 
this uh, tutorial. Maybe that's something that we need to submit as a book. I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> um, verify that the persistent volume got dynamically provisioned. It says to run kubectl get pvc, which does specify the volume if we run that. So let's see what we get if we run. Well, it specifies a volume with a capacity, but is this just the volume claim itself? Can we run kubectl get pv? Oh, if we run kubectl get pv, it's kind of hard to see, um, but there's a name, there's a capacity, access mode, reclaim policy, its status is bound. So it looks like it did actually auto-generate persistent volumes. So <laughs> Minikube via code is three star. <laughs> I agree. Minikube via cloud code is really nice. <laughs> So it, it does look like it actually created a, a persistent volume dynamically, which is great to know. Yeah, this is that's what I just ran, uh, is kubectl get pv right here. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, isn't that cool? Uh, so in theory, this should work. And I think the WordPress and MySQL should already be up and running. So if I run kubectl get services WordPress, let me clear again. I don't like it when my screen is full of all of that big text. Um, oh, but it has it as type load balancer. Okay. I was wondering, because I didn't see the type specified in the, oh, but, but that was because it was the MySQL. I didn't actually look at it in the WordPress one. In the WordPress service, it does say type load balancer. So that's not going to work out so well in Minikube, is it? <laughs> load balancer is really nice when you're working in a cloud provider. Because uh, generally, the cloud providers have uh, really convenient default on uh, plugins. Uh, if you run like in their managed services, I guess is the better way to describe that, um, where it'll spin up a load balancer in the cloud for you. So running load balancer in the cloud is so easy. But oh, OK, so the response should be like this, WordPress load balancer should be pending. I don't expect it to ever have an external IP because we don't have an actual load balancer in front of this load balancer. Uh, but it does have a cluster IP, and it is up on a node port, it looks like. Uh, fun fact, load balancer uh, type services actually require, like, they use node ports to do what they do. So that makes total sense that it would have a port, even though it's not type node port. I'm saying a lot of words that people might not understand here, but <laughs> uh, there are several different types of services. A cluster IP service means this app can talk to other things within the cluster. A load balancer type service means that uh, there's a load balancer of some type uh, that you'll use to get access to whatever containers you're actually running on Kubernetes. So that's what we've got here. Um, and then there's a, a node port type uh, service in Kubernetes, which will spin up an actual port on the node that the container is running on that you can access the container from. Um, and Load Balancer uses that, so we should be able to access this on a port. Minikube can only expose services through node port. The external IP is always pending. That's exactly what I was expecting. Uh, run the following command to get the IP address for the WordPress service. Let's see. I don't have the Minikube commands <laughs> installed. So that doesn't seem like it'll work very well. Um, so I don't know what my local uh, IP address for my Minikube is. I wonder how we can find that without me having the Minikube command line tool. Uh, downsides of using cloud code to, <laughs> to generate a Minikube cluster, I guess. Um, but then once we do that, I expect that we'll be able to see this. If I curl, mm, can't curl it because I don't know what the IP address is. <laughs> uh, hmm. Service WordPress URL. Mm, how do I find out what the IP address of my Minikube service is? Any suggestions for what I should look up here are most welcome. 
It's also almost 2.30, so I'm going to try to get off of here soon. Um, but I at least want to try. I know that it's running in Kubernetes. <laughs> a, we are running a personal blog in Kubernetes, but we're not running it online. We're not running it in the cloud. We're just running it locally. And I don't know how to access it right now. Yeah, the pods are up. So <laughs> we know that it's there. <laughs> Uh, but I'll have to figure out how to actually access my Minikube since I don't actually have the tool installed <laughs> a little bit later. So I don't want to keep people for too long. Yeah, next week we'll do part two and, and finish this up. So thank you all for joining me today. I had a lot of technical difficulties and I appreciate it so much for those of you who bared with me. I hope that you learned something interesting. Uh, and I hope that next time will be a lot smoother. <laughs> but thank you so much.